Good morning. Good morning. I'm pleased to be here with you today while my friend and colleague Peter is learning lessons from life. I see a few faces that I recognize. And it's a beautiful sunny day. Originally, I was going to use a reading from Burton Carley, who is a former um, chair of the Ministerial Fellowship Committee and also a minor league umpire, but I've changed my mind. And I'd show you the book, except it's on my iPad, so I can't show you the cover of the book that I'm taking this from, but there's a new book just recently come out in the past couple of weeks, but written by the president of NYU, John Sexton, along with Tom Oliphant and Peter Schwartz, called Baseball as a Road to God. Not the road, a road. So I thought I would share a little bit of that with you. Opening day is about more than pomp and circumstance. As Thomas Boswell put it in an essay titled, Why Time Begins on Opening Day. We know that something fine, almost wonderful, is about to begin. But we can't quite say why baseball seems so valuable, so indispensable to us. The game, which remains one of our broadest sources of metaphor, changes with our angle of vision, our mood. There seems to be no end to our succession of lucky discoveries. When opening day arrives, think how many baseball worlds begin revolving for seven months. By its very nature and rules, baseball operates outside of ordinary time. In fact, timelessness is at its essence. The length of an inning or a game is not set by a clock. It shares the boundless framework of Marcia Eliade's sacred time. It is not linear with simple past, present, and future. It's cyclical, building and building again toward certain quintessential moments. <coughs> For the religious, this cyclical liturgical time is marked by ritual and ceremony. The experience thus evoked is elevating, transporting the believer back to the original moment that is his spiritual root, in ilio tempore, literally in that time that is revered. The customs and practices of almost every religious tradition reveal such moments, from the advent and Lent of Christianity to the Jewish high holidays to Ramadan in Islam. As Eliade wrote, just as church constitutes a break in plane in the profane space of a modern city, the service celebrated inside it marks a break in profane temporal duration. For many fans, the most sacred times are opening day and the World Series. As the Hall of Fame infielder Rogers Hornsby said, people ask me what I do in winter when there's no baseball. I tell you what I do. I stare out the window and wait for spring. <laughs> Each spring, just before Easter and Passover, baseball elicits a sense of renewal. The cry, wait till next year, is prologue, replaced by hope. As Joe DiMaggio once said, you always get a special kick on opening day, no matter how many you go through. You look forward to it like a birthday party when you're a kid. You think something wonderful is going to happen. The anticipation that has built during the off-season ends as the players finally take the field. The wait is over. The slate is clean. No matter last season's record, all now are tied at zero wins and zero losses. And even last year's most moribund squad can dream of being champion. And as the 1991 Atlanta Braves and Minnesota Twins attest, that dream can become reality. For the first game of the season, ballparks often are dressed in red, white, and blue bunting. Sometimes the President of the United States appears, venturing to the pitcher's mound to toss a ceremonial first pitch, bringing baseball back to life. The long, dark nights of winter are over. Thank 
you. In the big inning, you're slow this morning. <laughs> it was a perfect spring day, April 14, 1910, at the American League Park in Washington, D.C. When I did some of this with my own congregation, I had a screen so I could show some pictures. I'll have to just leave them in the back later. But <clears throat> Here we have the Washington Senators playing the Philadelphia Athletics. Weighing in at nearly 300 pounds, President William Howard Taft walks out onto the field, baseball in hand. Having come from giving a speech to a gathering of suffragists where he was booed, this was friendly territory. With a record-breaking crowd of 12,226 people watching, he throws out the first ceremonial pitch of the new season to mad cheers. It is supposed to be caught by catcher Gabby Street, but Taft turns at the last minute and tosses it to the great pitcher Walter Johnson. This was the first time a president of the United States took part in the ritual opening of a baseball game, a tradition that has extended almost unbroken for 103 years with the exception of a single president, Jimmy Carter, and a rather unwelcomed Dick Cheney. President and later Supreme Court Justice William Howard Taft was a Unitarian. We start a lot of little traditions here and there that nobody picks up on. <laughs> this honorable event took place approximately 18 months after the Cubs had won the World Series. The last time that the Cubs had won the World Series. I learned about this obscure fact of our unheralded Unitarian history from a sermon written by my colleague, Mary Catherine Morn. The sermon was included in issue number 17 of the very last of the BUSI, the Baseball Unitarian Universalist Spiritual Intensive Journals. A journal for Unitarian Universalist ministers and a select few other wonderful people for whom baseball is a spiritual journey. That's what was on the, the top of it. The journal was lovingly compiled by my now retired colleague, Reverend Charlie Cast. He did this from 1994 to 2003. And everything in it was literally cut and pasted. He did not believe in email. He did not want to deal with computers. He thought it was all tools of the devil. From issue number three, I discovered the only other official baseball link, a player named Ethan Allen. He played from 1926 to 1938. He was purportedly a Unitarian. I have no way to verify this, but a Unitarian baseball player named Ethan Allen sounds about right. In the midst of hearing about the volatile situation in North Korea, the continuing civil war in Syria, tar sands oil spills, the budget charades in our nation's capital, the corporate takeover of state capitals, in the midst of being drowned out by all of this. Going through my file of Boosie journals and reading the collected works of my colleagues about baseball is an absolute delight, something I need to do to soothe my soul. And there were cartoons. I, again, will show them to you later, some of which you will see at coffee hour. It's like an oasis in a battle zone. We all need one. And baseball can provide that escape, even for only three or four hours at a time. I ask you, what is your oasis? I hope that each of you has one somewhere. One of the things I loved about getting that journal, which was really about a dozen pages of copied things that were sent to Charlie that he cut and pasted together, and he sent to us by mail, 
was finding all sorts of connections, even some Unitarian Universalist connections and humor. For example, our congregation in Joliet, Illinois has or had a softball team. This blurb was in one of their newsletters. The politically correct 96 UU Cubs. The 96 UU Cubs co-ed softball team has finished its third successful season, accomplishing every one of its prime directives. Prime directive number one, don't get hurt. No one did the entire season. Prime directive number two, get some hits. <gasps> we got lots of great hits. Prime directive number three, get some runs. <gasps> we scored it, runs in every game but one. In addition to all of these accomplishments, a team cheer was created. Go, fight, eat, <laughs> which evolved from all of the pizzas consumed after the games. The spirit on the team was so high, there's even been some talk about wearing team t-shirts next season. I don't think I've ever been part of a church that had its own softball team, but I'm sure they exist. They have to. Baseball has a long tradition of being connected to religion. There are ever philosophical inhabitants of the world of peanuts talking about the suffering of Job on the baseball field. And I might add, they don't even mention the Cubs. I probably ought to tell you this. I was born in Chicago, and from the age of 10, I have been doomed to be a Cub fan. It's something that gets injected into your DNA. It is not removable. I don't th know that other sports teams have quite the same resonance or religious reverence. There's even a f an official tradition in one of baseball's oldest parks, and I'm not sure if they've continued it. It used to be that clergy and women religious have been guests of the Red Sox in Fenway Park for decades, if not from the start. You contact the box office and they will give you tickets. They used to, I don't know. There's a portion of a stained glass window at the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York honoring baseball. Reverend Bruce Marshall, when serving our congregation in Cleveland, wrote the following. Michael Novak, the Catholic writer, has claimed, sports is somehow a religion. You either see or you don't see what the excitement is. This should not be a startling observation. Many have noted how the sports fanatic and the religious fanatic share similar traits, an obsession with the details of one's faith an inability to take anything else very seriously, an ultimate commitment that impedes rational decision-making and living an ordinary life. The religious fanatic and the sports fanatic are the same breed. But I'd rather depart from the fanatic concept and add a few of my own observations. Religion and sports, for me, baseball specifically, are institutions built on foundations of faith, doubt, memory, and hope. Yes, there is a sacred space which is intentionally different from any other one that one occupies. There is liturgy, prescribed actions and activity that are unique to the tradition and to the rules of the game. There is discipline in the practice of both with strict rules to follow. There are patterns and principles and uniforms for the players. There is all of that. But what enriches the experience of both is a knowledge base. There's one's own history and memories of connection to the sport and connection to religion. I always remember a time when I was a little girl, my father took us out of school because it was Passover, but he took us to the baseball game. <laughs> I could never quite reconcile that, although we did bring our own kosher potato chips. There's a broader understanding and appreciation for the history, the traditions, the human stories of gain and loss, of perfection and error, of joys and sorrows that come with both the sport and with one's faith. Blanche McCrary Boyd writes in her book, The Redneck Way of Knowledge, I kept staring at the altar near second base, 
Football and baseball have become, in the same decades which church attendance has declined, partial replacement for religion. Instead of God on Sunday morning, it's the game on Sunday afternoon. Spectator sports are ritualized public releases. And if football is closer to the extreme physicality of holy rollers, baseball is closer to the slow, mysterious repetition of Catholicism. Baseball is boring to the uninitiated, but to its devotees, it's a subtle world of mental excellences, concentration, asceticism, and tradition. Now, my husband's more of an omnivore when it comes to sports, but I find that baseball is the only thing that appeals to me. And we got into an argument one day about baseball and football. And the ultimate source of commentary about baseball and football, some of you may be aware of, is George Carlin. You may not agree with him, but what he had to say speaks to me. This is part of his famous routine. Baseball is a 19th century pastoral game. Football is a 20th century technological struggle. Baseball is played on a diamond in a park, the baseball park. Football is played on a gridiron in a stadium, sometimes called Soldier Field or War Memorial Stadium. Baseball begins in the spring, the season of new life. Football begins in the fall when everything is dying. In football, you wear a helmet. In baseball, you wear a cap. Football is concerned with downs. What down is it? Baseball is concerned with ups. Who's up? Are you up? I'm not up. He's up. In football, you receive a penalty. In baseball, you make an error. Oops. In football, the specialist comes in to kick. In baseball, the specialist comes in to relieve somebody. Football has hitting, clipping, spearing, piling on, personal falls, late hitting, and unnecessary roughness. Baseball has the sacrifice. <laughs> Football is played in any kind of weather, rain, snow, sleet, hail, fog. In baseball, if it rains, we don't go out to play. Baseball has the seventh inning stretch. Football has the two minute warning. Baseball has no time limit. We don't know when it's gonna end. We might have extra innings. Football is rigidly timed, to the commercials I might add, and will end even if we have to go to sudden death. In baseball during the game, this, in the stands there's kind of a picnic feeling. Emotions may run high or low, but there's not too much unpleasantness. In football, during the game in the stands, you can be sure at least 27 times you're capable of taking the life of a fellow human being. And finally, the objectives of the two games are completely different. In football, the objective is for the quarterback, also known as the field general, to be on target with his aerial assault, riddling the defense by hitting his receivers with a deadly ac accuracy in spite of the blitz, even if he has to use the shotgun. With short bullet passes and long bombs, he marches his troops into enemy territory, balancing his aerial assault with a sustained ground attack that punches holes in the forward wall of the enemy's defensive line. In baseball, the object is to go home <laughs> and be safe. I hope I'll be safe at home. <laughs> if you've never seen this routine, you, it's just... Personally, I find baseball to be a rather Unitarian Universalist kind of sport. It is very fair-minded. It is inclusive of athletes of all sizes and shapes. One is wildly praised and lauded for succeeding in one-third of the opportunities given at bat. A winning season is one when a team prevails in more than half of the games played. An extraordinarily good season would be marked with more than 60% of the games won. 
Perfection is rare, but it is possible. Even when a team reaches the end of the season and is eliminated from the playoffs, it can have a great effect on the final standings and outcome. There are many opportunities for redemption, and often a player who makes an error can turn right around and get a big hit. It is both an individual sport affirming the worth and dignity of everyone, and a team sport recognizing the interdependent web. And no sport is as tuned into the seasons as is baseball. The late A. Bartlett Giamatti, former president of Yale and commissioner of baseball, if you're into sports at all and have never seen his book, Take Time for Paradise, Americans and Their Games, this was written right after he died. It's marvelous. And there's a wonderful collection of Giamatti lore in another book that I've got. Giamatti wrote, it breaks your heart. It is designed to break your heart. The game begins in the spring when everything else begins again, and it blossoms in the summer, filling the afternoons and evenings. And then as soon as the chill rains come, it stops and leaves you to face the fall alone. You count on it, rely on it to buffer the best passage of time, to keep the memory of sunshine and high skies alive. And then, just when the days are all twilight, when you need it most, it stops and summer is gone. And now the current president of New York University, John Sexton, in his book, Baseball as a Road to God adds, while the teams and players on the field may change each autumn, the game's evocative power is continuous. Opening day in the spring and the World Series in the fall are the bookends of baseball's liturgical time. And within the rituals of each season, fans are converted to believers. Players, managers, and even owners become saints or sinners. And even be, events become part of a mythology, forever remembered and repeated with the solemnity of the most beloved sacred stories. Event, and event, in, inevitably, each season brings its moments of heightened awareness, divergent from ordinary time and place, in which some discover a connection to something deeper than the ordinary. Such moments are remembered not merely for what they literally were, but, but for what they evoked in those experiences of them. And Giamatti again, but every day and every game brings anew the possibility of hope. And even when hope is dashed in the fall, we utter the words, wait till next year. We know there will be another chance at redemption. At Wrigley Field, we Cub fans have been known for holding up signs in the bleachers saying, wait till next year on the second day of the season. <laughs> and I have to say, after watching the end of last night's Cubs game, I have a feeling when they appear at home for their first opening day, there may be those signs out there on the opening day. I spent many years in the Boston area. Red Sox fans waited from 1918 for a World Series victory. I could easily speak to and with Sox fans about heartbreak, patience, loyalty, persistence, faith, and hope. And then their time came in 2004. Red Sox fans have not been the same since. <laughs> Frankly, if and when the Cubs ever win in my lifetime, I don't know what that would do to my and millions of other Cubs fans' psyches. Memory and hope, anticipation and heartbreak, but always hope. Always hope. That's what it's about. The memories that many of us have of going to our first real life baseball game or games thereafter often last a lifetime. There are distinctive memories, the smells of hot dogs mis mixed with popcorn, beer, and soda. I would venture that each stadium has its own unique smells. 
and those who travel from one to another would probably know where they were blindfolded. There's a visual delight when coming through the concrete passageways to emerge in the sunlight and see the vast field of emerald green. Giamatti said, when I was seven years old, my father took me to Fenway Park for the first time. And as I grew up, I knew that as a building, it was on the level with Mount Olympus, the Pyramid at Giza, the nation's capital, the Tsar's Winter Palace, and the Louvre. <laughs> Except, of course, it was better than all those inconsequential places. There are the sounds of leather baseballs hitting leather mitts, the crack of the bat that somehow sounds different when it connects for a very long time, for a very long hit. The sounds of the crowd cheering and yes, sometimes booing. The intimacy of the park also brings spontaneous conversations with total strangers, exchanging notes, memories, statistics, stories. For a child, it's magical. Every sense is stimulated. It's a time of bonding with adults, of hero worship, of great aspirations. And for an adult, it brings us back to our childhood. Life lessons of winning and losing are an integral part of the game. Cubs fans, Red Sox fans, and even Phillies fans too know that life deals us setbacks. Often, it's how we deal with the setbacks and keep coming back to face a new day that distinguishes us from the fair weather fans that so many teams have. It is good to learn that even the best laid plans can run afoul of chance and circumstance. The best we can do is rebound from them with grace. There is always another game to be played and an opportunity to contribute and win. There were high hopes for the Phillies last year, as I recall. The starting pitcher lineup had the promise to be one of which legends were made. I remember a year that the Cubs were in that same boat. Best starting rotation in the majors. Things didn't quite work out the way we thought for either team, did they? This year we enter into it perhaps a little more cautiously. But hope is always with us when the season starts. And no matter what happens to either of our teams as we go through the summer, baseball can provide us with that greatly needed oasis of sights and sounds and smells and pure athleticism that will carry us away, if even for a short while, from our immediate cares and woes. Whether it be on the little league field, a minor league game, some of those are lots of fun, on the car radio or at one of the great cathedrals of the game, we need an escape from the fears and sadness that come with every morning newspaper and come uninvited into our homes. The baseball season has begun. Spring is officially here. Memory, hope, tradition, redemption, hits and errors, sacrifices and choices are all part of baseball and all part of life. Unitarian Universalism is spoken of as an optimistic faith. We need the oasis in the middle of the work that we are called to do to bring peace and justice into the world. Even here on a Sunday morning, the new season begins a celebration of hope. Whatever your fears and doubts may be, let there be hope. Let there be joy. Let there be laughter. And may you find your way home and be safe. Thank you.